Greetings, everyone, and a warm welcome. We appreciate you joining us today. In this video, we'll delve into the unsettling story surrounding Suzanne von Richfenfen. So please, get comfortable as we delve into the details. Back in 2002, Brazil found itself captivated by the Suzanne von Richfenfen case. While the nation celebrated its football team's victory in the World Cup against Germany and Japan, the fervor of this soccer-crazed country shifted abruptly from sports to the enigmatic tale of Suzanne von Richfenfen. I mention soccer, or football as it's known in most parts of the world, excluding North America, where I'm, of course, referring to the events of 1983 in San Paulo. She hailed from a multicultural background, with a German father named Manfred Albert von Ritterfen and a Brazilian mother named Morciai, who had Lebanese roots. Manfred served as an engineer and held the position of director at the State Company for Highway Development in San Paulo, while Morciai, born in 1987, played a significant role in their family. Suzanne, born in 1983, began her academic journey at a German high school before pursuing law at a Catholic university in San Paulo. Described as a cheerful individual with a touch of shyness, Suzanne maintained a strong bond with her parents and brother. Their residence was a comfortable abode located in a gated community in the Campo Bel El neighborhood of San Paulo. Suzanne's family was well off, with an estimated wealth of $5,500,000 million in 2002. She, herself, possessed qualities of being well-educated and attractive, embodying a life rooted in both German and Brazilian cultures. In the summer of 1999, she started practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where she got to know Daniel Cravinhos de Paulo da Silva, who soon became her boyfriend. Suzani's parents at first allowed her relationship with Daniel, but soon changed their opinion of him when they discovered that he used marijuana almost daily. He did not work or attend college, and did not come from a particularly good neighborhood. In July 2002, her parents were on vacation, so Daniel moved in with Suzanne for a month, much to her delight. When her parents returned home, Suzanne suggested that they buy her a flat in which she could live with Daniel, but her father refused, saying that she could do whatever she liked, only if she earned money herself. Suzanne's relationship with Daniel started to put a strain on her relationship with her parents. Her parents pressured her to break off the relationship, but she refused. They then threatened to cut off her allowance. On the evening of October 31, 2002, Suzanne accompanied her brother to a cyber CF for a gathering with friends and some video gaming. Subsequently, she returned home with her boyfriend, Daniel, and his 26-year-old brother, Christian. Earlier that same evening, Suzanne had disabled the burglar alarm, switched off the video security cameras, and parked her car in the garage. Upon arriving home, Daniel and Christian donned hoods as they prepared to enter the house. Suzanne took the lead, heading upstairs to her parents' bedroom. She illuminated the hallway to confirm her parents were asleep before descending to the living room and settling on the couch. Meanwhile, the brothers ascended to the parents' bedroom, where they proceeded to assault Suzanne's parents using iron bars. Despite sustaining severe brain trauma, Suzanne's parents did not succumb swiftly. In a bid to hasten their demise, Daniel hurried to the bathroom and returned with two damp towels, attempting to muffle the sounds emanating from the victims. Unfortunately, this proved ineffective. Seeking an alternative, Daniel ventured to the kitchen and reappeared with a jug of water, employing it in an attempt to drown Suzanne's parents. This succeeded in claiming the life of her father, Manfred. However, Marisha, Suzanne's mother, remained alive at this juncture. Undeterred, they secured a plastic bag around her head until she eventually succumbed to suffocation. With the harrowing ordeal concluded, Suzanne ascended to witness the tragic outcome her parents now lifeless. The trio then proceeded to implement the second phase of their plan, transforming the scene to simulate a break-in. They scattered discovered money, creating disarray by strewing papers throughout the house. This phase of the plan exhibited a lack of finesse, as they overlooked valuables, cell phones, 
and even the firearm items typically retained by burglars. Contrary to conventional burglary behavior, they did, however, abscond with the family's substantial cash reserves, comprising both US dollars and euros, before making their exit. Subsequently, Daniel and Suzanne secured an alibi by checking into a motel, while Christian opted for a fast food restaurant. Shortly before three in the morning, they vacated the motel. Suzanne, after dropping off her boyfriend, collected her 15-year-old brother, Andreas, from an internet cafe and returned home. It was at this point that they stumbled upon the crime scene and promptly notified the police. The investigators harbored skepticism about the incident being a botched burglary and swiftly leaned towards the theory that the perpetrator was acquainted with the victims. Their scrutiny turned towards the children and employees of the Ritrofen family. It wasn't solely the peculiar crime scene, marked by a deactivated alarm system and meticulously arranged papers, that raised suspicions. The investigators were also struck by Suzanne's remarkable composure. She was observed casually swimming with Daniel in the house pool the day after the murders and even celebrated her 19th birthday with friends mere hours after her parents' burial. The investigative focus zeroed in on Suzanne and her boyfriend. The breakthrough for the arrest materialized when attention shifted to Christian, who, a few days later, purchased a motorcycle with a substantial sum of cash, notably in $100 bills. On November 9, 2002, a few days after the incident, he, along with his brother Daniel and Suzanne, was apprehended. Suzanne quickly succumbed to the pressure and confessed to the murder. The investigation wrapped up within a week. The case garnered extensive media coverage in Brazil, primarily due to the stark disparity between the heinous crime and Suzanne's personal demeanor. While the brothers adhered to the stereotypical profile of uneducated, unemployed, and drug-addicted perpetrators, Suzanne defied this mold. She was a strikingly attractive blonde hailing from an upper-middle-class family of German and Lebanese heritage. Known for her good behavior and academic achievements, Suzanne's involvement in such a gruesome crime was both shocking and perplexing. The contrast between her affluent upbringing and the cruelty of a crime shocked the nation. The Brazilian public questioned whether Suzanne was the evil mind behind the crime, or just Daniel's tool. Many people who initially were emotionally on Suzanne's side changed their opinion when a TV interview with her was shown. Before the interview took place, the cameras had already started rolling, and she was instructed to cry out loud during the broadcast so it would create public sympathy. In the end, however, the interview was a major blow for her credibility. In July 2006, nearly four years following the tragic events, Suzanne, along with Daniel and Christian, faced trial in St. Paulo for first-degree murder. During the proceedings, Suzanne shifted the blame entirely onto Daniel, while the brothers contended that they merely executed her wishes. In the courtroom, Suzanne maintained a remarkably composed demeanor, devoid of emotion, while the brothers were visibly emotional, often in tears. On a peculiar occasion, Suzanne even erupted into laughter. She asserted that her actions were driven by love, expressing fear that Daniel would abandon her if her parents were not eliminated. Her lawyer said that Suzanne had no motive at all to kill, but was forced to the crime by Daniel, whom she adored like a god. Another part of the motive may have been the parents' wealth, which Suzanne would inherit in the event of the parents' death. The prosecution said that Suzanne wanted to get her hands on the money and assets of her parents, and she wanted freedom and independence without having to work for it. On trial, her defense lawyer claimed that Suzanne was physically violated by her father, which she and her brother Andreas deny. It was also claimed that Suzanne's parents were alcoholics, but the autopsy found no alcohol in their bodies. The prosecution called Suzanne the mastermind of the crime. They demanded 50 years imprisonment for each of the three defendants. Suzanne was described as a personification the evil blonde. On July 22 ND 2006, Suzanne was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the crime. Daniel, her boyfriend, received the same sentence and his brother Christian was sentenced to 38 years for conspiracy. In 2009, 
Suzanne tried to get her sentence changed to house arrest. Her appeal was denied. She then tried again two years later the same result. In 2011 her younger brother Andreas sued his sister for her half of the inheritance, including the money paid out on her parents' life insurance he won. Hey guys, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to be uploading twice a week, probably on Mondays and Thursdays. Remember to hit the little bell icon and subscribe to keep up to date with new posts, as well as dropping a like and leave me a comment with your thoughts. And I will see you again soon for another briefcase.